Well, good morning. Let's begin with prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for another opportunity to come together and worship you. We give you thanks that even in this place, this fellowship hall, this place that is not our usual meeting place, that, that your spirit has been present, that you have been among us, and we give you thanks for that. We ask that you would continue to pour out our spirit on us as we seek to follow you. Bless our time together this morning and open your word to us, that we might know you better. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're continuing our series on the super fruits, the fruits of the spirit, uh, which uh, God, through his spirit, develops in us, hopefully, if we're seeking him and trying to, to find ways to follow him. Now, in the list uh, that we have been using from Galatians 5, 22 and 23, our next fruit is gentleness. However, this is one uh, that, that I had a bit of a problem with the translators on. Because the word here, which is translated gentleness, really means humility. In fact, uh, the word gentle is not used all that often in the Bible, but I went back to see you know, if I could find all the times that the word gentle is used. Uh, and the few times I found them in the Old Testament, there's a number of different words that are translated as gentle, none of which actually mean gentle. Now here, in the New Testament, where it says gentleness, well, gentleness is one of the possible uh, uses of the word. But it really is usually translated, and I think is more useful, translated humility. Because for me, I think humility for us as human beings is really the key fruit, the, the one that helps us to develop all the others. Let me show you what I mean. Turn with me for a minute. If you have your Bible, or you have one of the few Bibles, uh, not hard to find, right at the beginning, Genesis. The end of chapter 2. And this isn't even our text for today, but I want to start there. In verse 15, it tells us, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to keep it and uh, to till it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may eat freely of every tree in the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. So he gives him one commandment. You can eat from everything else in the garden, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then it goes on. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make for him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground of God, uh, the Lord God formed every creature and animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called that every living creature, that was his name. So he created all of them. But there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman. For out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And here's the kicker. Verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Okay, now, why were they not ashamed? It's because at this point in the history of humanity, these two people were completely unselfconscious. They had no self-consciousness. They were completely other-focused. God had given them a job to do, to till and to care for the garden, and they were totally focused on doing their job and on making sure that the other was properly taken care of and that their relationship with God 
was where it should be. They, they were completely other focused. They had no self consciousness. So they were naked and not ashamed because it didn't matter. They weren't aware. But look what happens in the next chapter. The serpent enters the garden and has a little conversation with Eve. Now the serpent in chapter 3 was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? No, God didn't say that. The woman said to the serpent, Well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. Now, if you were paying attention a few minutes ago, he never actually said, Don't touch the tree. But remember, she was created after God had made the commandment to Adam. And you can probably imagine Adam saying, Oh, oh by the way, there is a rule around here. We, we can eat of everything, but um, that tree over there, we, we can't eat it. In fact, don't even touch it. So, <clears throat> the serpent goes on and says to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat, it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Now, any of you who want to blame this all on the woman, just pay attention. Her <laughs> husband was right there with her. Where was he in this conversation? Probably reading the sports. <laughs> <clears throat> so, in verse, where were we? Six? Seven? Yes. Okay. So they eat of it. In verse seven, then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. So, as soon as they disobey God, as soon as they listen to the serpent, and they eat of the one tree they were told not to eat of, as soon as that happens, they become self-aware. They become self-conscious. They realize that they're naked and they try to hide themselves. They try to cover themselves. <coughs> and I think this is the essence of sin. Is that we lose our focus on other people. And we can become self-focused and self-centered. And it's all about me. What I want, what I need. And we forget about God. And we forget about other people. That really is the, the essence of sin. And, and humility, we, we tend to think of humility as thinking of putting ourselves down. Thinking of others as as better than us. Well, that really isn't the essence of humility. Humility is recognizing that others exist and focusing on them and their needs. Trusting that, that God is going to provide for our needs so we don't need to be focused on that. We focus on others. And so humility is the one fruit that begins to counter the curse that came with Adam and Eve and the initial sin. It begins to turn us from being self-centered to being other-centered. From focusing on ourselves to focusing on someone else. Everyone else. Now our actual text for this morning comes from John chapter 13. Starting at verse 1. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. 
And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, he got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. But Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who is bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, for this reason, he said, not all of you were clean. After he had washed their feet, he put on his robe and had returned to the table. And he said to them, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but it is to fulfill the scripture. The one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me, I tell you this now before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Very truly I tell you, whoever receives one whom I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This story still amazes me every time I read it. Here is Jesus himself, the very Son of God, God himself. Now, if, if anyone has a right to, to look down on others or to think themselves superior to other people, Jesus would be that one. And yet Jesus, who is himself God, wraps himself in a towel and kneels at the feet of his disciples, at, at the feet of his own creation, and washes their feet. And, and not just the disciples. Now, I mean, he is a disciple at this point, but Judas is present. Judas is with them at this dinner. Judas is one of the ones who Jesus washes his feet. The man he knows already is going to betray him. The one he knows is going to lead him into crucifixion. And he kneels and he washes his feet. This story is, is the very essence of humility. That God himself would kneel down and wash the feet of not only his friends, not, not only those whom he had created, but the very one who was going to betray him. It doesn't change who Jesus is. Jesus is still the Son of God. Jesus is still all-powerful, almighty God. But he chooses he chooses to kneel down and to wash their feet. And he says, he says very specifically, you have seen what I have just done for you. Now, Peter, as it's happening, Peter doesn't get it. And when Jesus approaches him, he says, 
Are you nuts? You're not going to wash my feet. That, that's something servants do. You, you shouldn't be kneeling down and washing our feet. And Jesus says, it has to be this way. And so, Peter, being the outspoken knucklehead that he is, says, oh, well, fine then. Don't just stop at my feet, wash my hands and my head as well. <coughs> well, you don't need to wash all of you if you're clean. Just your feet. Now, you see, in this time period, where, where they were, when you're getting ready to go to a dinner like they were having, you would have cleaned yourself as best you could in the circumstances and, and headed off to dinner. But on your way to dinner, walking through dirty, dusty streets in sandals, your feet would have gotten dirty. So it was customary that the host would provide water or even servants to wash your feet when you arrived so that they would be clean as well. But here, Jesus is the host. And he not only provides water, he actually kneels and does the washing. And so he tells Peter, you, you don't need to wash all of you. You're already clinging. You've already bought in to the kingdom. But not all of you. Because he knew Judas had already agreed to betray him. But he didn't say, so Judas, you need to stand over against the wall because uh, you won't be included in this uh, little ceremony we're having here. No, he, he washed Judas' feet as well. Now, if you think about that, if you, if you try to, to reason that out, if Jesus, God himself, could kneel down and wash the feet of his own creation, if he could even wash the feet of the very one who was going to betray him, who could possibly be beneath your care? Who could possibly fall outside the realm of, of your humility? You see, that's what we are called to do as Jesus' followers, as, as disciples. And he says it very plainly. I have set you an example. If, if I, your teacher and your master and your Lord, have, have knelt down and washed your feet, you also should do the same thing. Now, he doesn't necessarily mean that we should actually physically wash one another's feet, although sometimes that can be very powerful. But what he means is we are to serve one another. We are, we are to take care of one another. We are, we are to be other-focused. We are to make sure that everyone has what they need even if it means putting ourselves to the side. That's what he calls us to, is humility. And, and if, if we can allow the Spirit to work in us, if, if we can allow ourselves to learn how to be humble, how to, how to reach out in love and charity to other people, we will find that we begin to love other people. We'll find that we discover a joy in living that we had never known before. We'll find that when we're not so wrapped up in our own stuff and worrying about how I'm going to get what I want all the time, that we develop a peace that passes all understanding. When we're not so concerned about ourselves and, and where we have to be and when we have to be there and all the things that we have to do to make our lives the way that they should be, we may find that we develop patience with other people. And when we're humble, we have a tendency to be kind. If we can allow God 
Allow His Spirit to work in us. And if we can begin to realize that if Jesus could kneel down at the feet of His creation, we too should be able to reach out to any and to all in love and mercy and service. In Jesus' name, Amen.